much, uh, Matthew, and uh, thank you, Shri, for inviting us. Uh, in, in this unusual time, uh, one additional unusual uh, thing for me is that uh, that's the first time, as I mentioned, I've given a presentation from a hotel room. Uh, so I hope that uh, uh, it will not affect uh, negatively the, the quality uh, and uh, it will go all right. So, but let me know if, if you have uh, issues. Um, with uh, the sound so um so my my part will be about the final uh, sections of the book uh the the final uh, uh part of the book is called um uh, sequential data with decision making and uh, this part of the book covers uh, both reinforcement learning and um, inverse reinforcement learning but before uh, going into uh, explanation about what these things are, uh, I would like to start with a couple of my favorite quotes by Vladimir Vapnik, uh, one of the founding fathers of, of machine learning and inventor of support vector machine. Uh, and uh, uh, these quotes are shown here, especially uh, the one which I like uh, and think it's quite relevant to the whole paradigm of uh, reinforcement learning is this second quote, which says, one should, not, one should avoid solving more difficult intermediate problems when solving a target problem. And uh, to me, uh, this uh, signifies, uh, like this uh, 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 reinforcement learning implements uh, uh, in, in some sense, uh, this second Vapnik's principle. Uh, it, it does it in the following sense. So reinforcement learning offers some sort of a paradigm shift in, in how we can do finance. It's not how we uh, do it uh, usually, uh, but uh, the, the shift would be the following. So uh, traditionally in quantitative finance, what we do, we find uh, some predictive signals. They should be predictive of, their, uh, of themselves and they should somehow correlate with the future asset returns, right? So once we extracted them, those alpha signals, then we use them in, in our trading strategies. So, so the sequence of steps here is that we first build some sort of a predictive model for the future, and, and then we uh, uh, plug uh, this model and use them and, and use it for, uh, for uh, coming up with training strategy. Uh, however, it's not the, the only possible paradigm. Uh, and the approach to reinforcement learning is exactly swaps uh, this, uh, these two things around. So the, the focus of reinforcement learning approach is to act optimal, right? And, um, uh, but uh, what you do about prediction of the future is a secondary task here, right? So sometimes future can be like uh, the, the model of dynamics can be highly complex and still your actions uh, might be simple. So, so, so there are uh, cases in which, um, in, in which you, you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, develop very sophisticated model of the future, uh, or, uh, but you, you, you can directly focus on, on, on you know, uh, acting optimally. And of course, this is not to say that uh, uh, building uh, models and, and finding predictive signals has no value, uh, uh, very far from saying that, but it says that the paradigm of reinforcement learning exactly, uh, uh, you know, turns uh, this sequence of in, in, in its own way. So, uh, so this is one of the reasons I like reinforcement learning because it implements its principle. The second thing, it also incorporates a so-called feedback loop, which, uh, which makes it, uh, in my view, uh, particularly attractive for uh, applications in quantitative finance because very often we see, uh, you know, it's a classical situation uh, when you find the good signals, uh, they are predictable for themselves, predictable for the future. Uh, uh, you use them in every, uh, for example, transaction costs. So, so there is no uh, uh, the approach based on forecasting the future does not incorporate any sort of a feedback loop, uh, which might be very important as every uh, practitioner in finance knows. Right, uh, so now let me uh, briefly talk about the, the, the paradigm of reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, uh, you have uh, uh, two, uh, two uh, players in a game. Uh, you have an agent, uh, which can be a trader for financial applications. Uh, 
or some other financial agent and your uh, environment. Uh, in uh, real, uh, in applications which involve uh, interaction in real time, uh, this is a some sort of a physical or financial environment, but in applications which uh, work offline uh, in a batch mode setting, uh, this can be simply understood as a source of data. Uh, so the interaction between these two uh, players proceeds as follows. The agent uh, receives the information from the environment, uh, which is codified in this uh, state vector, ST code, or we'll code here ST. Uh, and the state vector can include market prices, it can include the uh, private information of the agent, such as the composition of the agent's portfolio. Uh, and anything else which might be relevant for constructing optimal uh, strategy. Upon receiving this information, the, act, uh, the agent acts. So the, the task of reinforcement learning is a sequential multi-step decision-making process and extends over mu uh, multiple steps in time. And, and each time uh, the, uh, what happens here uh, is repeated. So the, at each time moment T, the agent receives the information from the market and then it acts. Uh, so there is an action variable AT, which goes from the agent to the environment. And in applications for trading, it will be your trades, your portfolio trades, the vector of portfolio trades or changes of the position. Uh, now, the, the objective of doing this whole thing is to maximize so-called rewards, uh, which is the same as uh, the utility function in the uh, financial and classical finance. So what is the reward? Reward is a generally a function of the, the state variable and the action variable. And uh, uh, agent, the agent is uh, uh, assumed to receive uh, one step reward upon taking every action. And the reward can be positive or negative, but the total objective of the agent is to maximize these this rewards. The total value of the rewards discounted with using some discount factor. Um, uh, now, because rewards depend on the state uh, and, and the state evolves, uh, can evolve stochastically, it can also be partially impacted by the actions of the agent and that's why we have this extremely important feedback loop which i mentioned before which is unique to reinforcement learning and not encountered in uh, supervised learning or unsupervised learning so they uh, because of these two things they the environment changes in time and therefore uh, the agent cannot simply maximize the uh, total cumulative reward to rather maximize this, the expected value of the future uh, cumulative reward, which is determined by how the agent acts. Uh, and, now, and how the agent acts is defined, is determined by the so-called uh, policy function. So policy function is exactly a prescription how the agent should act, uh, what action it should take, uh, A, uh, given the state of the environment. All right, and this whole formulation is, is actually a generalization of very classical approaches of dynamic programming pioneered by Bellman, Robert Bellman in the 1950s, uh, which uh, uh, is designed to work actually in uh, real world problems, which are typically highly dimensional. A classical uh, uh, dynamic programming approach only much more dimensional and discrete state action space. All right. Uh, uh, now, uh, now this is a, just a repetition of the same um, of the same uh, uh, slide in a specifically in the setting of uh, trading. So your agent becomes a portfolio manager, and uh, your environment uh, becomes data. All right, uh, now uh, there is uh, another very interesting twist to this whole approach of um, reinforcement learning called inverse reinforcement learning or IRL for short. Uh, so what's the difference between reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning? The difference is both in the data that you have and in the task that you're trying to uh, uh, address. Uh, in reinforcement learning, as I said, the objective is to uh, maximize the total uh, reward uh, accumulated over course of actions um, 
uh, when you assume that you know uh, the, the reward, you, you, can, you can define it as a function or you can just uh, get a numerical values. Uh, what's important is the second one. So if you know what kind of rewards you get upon taking any uh, action uh, given a state S, then you can maximize the sum of these things. Now, in, uh, in the approach of inverse reinforcement learning, uh, the reason it's called inverse is because it's kind of uh, the same problem flipped on its head uh, in the following sense. Imagine that you have a, a history uh, data, historical data, uh, which amounts to a sequence of the information from the market, uh, including price and whatever else you want to include there, and, and also trades or actions taken uh, upon uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, when receiving this information. Now, uh, this is all very similar to the previous formulation. The difference, the critical difference is now we don't know the reward. So, so you observe some behavior and you want to explain or rationalize this behavior. And, and clearly, this is a very, very uh, uh, generic uh, problem. And clearly it has uh, lots of potential applications not just in finance, but uh, in, in many other uh, fields, such as, for example, marketing, uh, et cetera. Uh, but specifically for finance, uh, uh, there are uh, obviously many interesting potential applications. For example, if you trade over the counter, uh, so you observe uh, uh, trades uh, of your counterparty, uh, you can try uh, to apply this formalism and infer the, 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 the motives, the, the uh, utility function or reward function, which was maximized by your counterparts. And then once you do this, you can probably uh, use it to your advantage, right? Uh, but this clearly uh, assumes that you do observe uh, traits of your counterparts. And uh, in most of financial applications, it's not the case. Uh, because uh, you trade through the exchange and you do not observe actions of other um, agents. Uh, but I will talk a little bit more uh, later about uh, what are other interesting uh, problems which are based on IRL formulation that you can uh, uh, formulate there and address. Right? Uh, but first I want to say a few words about uh, uh, you know, like general uh, recommendations and, 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 and based on our experience of working with uh, such algorithms. So, uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, the reinforcement learning is an is a extension uh, 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 and improvement over classical uh, methods of, um, of uh, dynamic programming. Um, uh, which uh, uh, was given a strong push recently in recent years by companies uh, such as uh, Google or OpenAI, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, most of the reported progress so far uh, was reported in video games and robotics. And in particular, uh, uh, the approach which is uh, advocated by, uh, for example, DeepMind is, is the so-called deep RL. So basically deep RL, deep reinforcement learning, is a combination of uh, principles and ideas of reinforcement learning uh, with uh, uh, very powerful uh, methods of function approximation based on neural nets. Um, uh, as as uh, uh, presented uh, by Matthew, and uh, as uh, some of you may uh, know from elsewhere, um, Neural nets are very powerful function approximations, and then they can be used to, to, uh, to produce very flexible uh, uh, specification, uh, non parametric specification for different objects which are encountered in reinforcement learning, such as value function or policy function. However, the word of uh, caution uh, that uh, I wanted to sound here is uh, about big differences between applications of uh, reinforcement learning for video games and robotics and applications to uh, finance. So in robotics and video games, you typically have plenty of data. Uh, you have a very uh, low noise level and the dimensionality of the state action space is uh, normally not too high. So it's, it's typically intense maybe. Uh, 
Uh, however, none of this uh, is the typical case for finance uh, because in finance we have uh, tons of noise. It's mostly about noise. Uh, we don't have uh, plenty of data unless you're talking about high frequency trading. Uh, and uh, the dimensionality of the state action spaces is extremely high. Uh, it's in, in, in hundreds. Uh, even if you deal with something like simple, like specialized uh, equity fund uh, with a strong reduction of the, of the possible choices of stocks, right? So, so the short, short conclusion is that RL for finance is very different for, from RL uh, in Atari games. And then the natural question would be how we should proceed, how you should start with using RL or IRL in finance. And our recommendations are listed here. So first, uh, uh, I would recommend to avoid the temptation to start with available off-the-shelf uh, deep RL libraries, even though they're available and easy to try. Uh, and the chances are that uh, they would not work uh, as you expected from the start and may not even work as you expected uh, to the end until you give up on them. Uh, and uh, on a similar note, uh, I suggest avoid uh, the temptation to start with deep learning as a way of uh, function approximation. Um, and uh, uh, instead, the, 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 a good starting point would be we start with simple models, which avoid uh, black box type of architectures, uh, but instead offer semi-analytical solutions uh, in terms of linear algebra and convex optimization. Uh, and this is achievable. Uh, it's not always achievable. Uh, there is a trick here. Uh, this sort of models is only achievable and available if, you, if your model of the agent reward is simple enough. Uh, and by simple enough, I mean uh, it should be quadratic in uh, states and action. And admittedly, it's not always possible. Uh, and therefore, there is still a huge potential for uh, more flexible uh, 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 approaches based on uh, neural nets to reinforce machine learning. However, to understand it, to develop the intuition, and to have a, be a, a, a benchmark for, for comparison, uh, uh, I still believe that uh, the, this approach has a strong appeal and the value. All right, uh, so, uh, and also the other uh, attractive thing about that is that it established links with classical methods for optimal control. So only after you experience with that and get, develop the intuition, then I recommend that uh, you uh, can switch to using uh, neural nets uh, as a well function approximation, uh, but only if it's needed, only if you cannot proceed with such simple quadratic reward functions uh, and, and you understand all the steps involved. All right, uh, so very briefly here, uh, there is uh, obviously I have no chance to explain anything in this presentation. Uh, but uh, uh, except for high level concepts and, uh, and I would re uh, refer you to the book uh, for very detailed um, uh, presentations starting from very basic models, which I will uh, talk about in a second, but here is just the overview. So this is uh, what is called the causality diagram for market decision process. Uh, the, the, uh, the difference here, so uh, the, the, you have a sequence of uh, which are assumed to undergo Markovian dynamics, uh, but this is controlled Markovian dynamics because you have these action variables which act as control variables. Yeah, and as I showed before, upon acting uh, uh, on the state, the agent receives rewards, and the objective is to uh, uh, maximize the expected value of it with total discounted uh, reward. All right, uh, and the way it's achieved is, uh, as I mentioned before, is uh, via specifying what is called a policy. The policy, which is essentially a map from uh, your state uh, action, uh, from, sorry, from your state space to the action space. And this policy can be either deterministic uh, or, or it can be stochastic, uh, which means that in stochastic case, you deal with the distribution. Uh, let me, in the interest of time, 
this is uh, this slide is only to show you the flavor of how these equations look like. And uh, let me talk a little bit about our uh, one of our, uh, uh, our examples in the book, uh, which we work out in details, and also uh, the notebooks that we will make available for Quad University uh, are based on this example. So this example is our adaptation of a very famous uh, problem uh, from a, a book by Sutton and Bartow uh, on reinforcement learning, which they call the cliff walking problem. Uh, which we uh, translated into uh, what we call the financial problem. And uh, this is probably the, the simplest uh, possible financial problem for RL. So uh, what's happening here is the following. Imagine that you, are, uh, mm, uh, uh, you have a bank account, uh, not you, but an agent. Um, uh, has a bank account, and uh, this bank account should be maintained over a uh, number of steps. Uh, here it's uh, like um, the, the task is to maintain the minimum amount on the account such that, uh, 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 so, such that the, so, so he, the, the, the diagram is shown here. This is the time, and this is the uh, amount on the account uh, discretized for to four discrete values for simplicity. And the agent starts at this point. Uh, at initially, the agent has uh, zero amount on the account. So the first action is taken is to deposit the minimum amount on the account, and this is shown here. Uh, now, the, 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 the tricky part here is that each action uh, of the agent here incurs transaction costs. So, so the agent pays either for depositing uh, money on the account or for withdrawing money from the account, a fixed amount. Uh, and therefore the optimal strategy of the agent is to deposit the minimum required amount and then do nothing over the course of, uh, uh, of this uh, history. So after completing, so you hold this account for a number of steps and then you close it. So the only two actions which are part of the optimal trajectory is to deposit in one dollar or whatever the minimum amount is, and then withdrawing the same amount. All right. So what can be simpler than that? There is no noise. There is no nothing than that, right? And obviously for human, um, uh, you would you would say, okay, this is what you have to do to avoid bankruptcy, right? The idea here is that there are some some uh, uh, liabilities for the agent, and uh, and then uh, the, if the agent withdraw money given in the, uh, in the state of uh, minimum deposit, then uh, it will lead to bankruptcy. Bankruptcy should be with, uh, avoided, right? Uh, so it's clearly very easy to explain to a human, but not at all easy to explain to, uh, to a robot, uh, right? And, um, and uh, the example, I, 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 I unfortunately, I can't explain details of these uh, algorithms, but those are essentially two of the most famous algorithms in reinforcement learning. One is called SARSA and another is called uh, Q-learning. And this graph shows how the, the training uh, goes, how the, the algorithm uh, learns, the agent learns to, to, to do this optimal pose. And what you can see here is that the plateau is reached only after like 300 steps. So it's entirely non-trivial to teach an agent even for such simplest problem, right? Which doesn't include as I said, nothing, uh, right? So this already might give you an indication uh, that uh, RL for trading can be not easy. Very tricky. Yeah. I had conversations with people who tried deep reinforcement um, without actually trying to understand what's going on behind the scene. And the response was uh, pretty similar from all of them. Uh, a, it's very hard to understand when it works, when it doesn't work, and it, when it works, why it works, etc. Right, uh, and this has to do with my comments uh, before. Right uh, now, um, so in our book we have one uh, notebook which uh, which uh, shows how you can formalize and train. Back to you. Uh, yeah, I apologize for that. Uh, it's unusual times and. Um, Unusual circumstances. Uh, yeah, I, I um, so I just wanted to say that um, we uh, have also in the book the uh, the applications of uh, the examples of using 
inverse reinforcement learning for the same problem. Um, and the objective is again to understand how it works. So we have a few uh, very popular methods of inverse reinforcement learning. One is called maximum entropy IRL. Another is called IRL from failure. And the third one, which is uh, which appears the most interesting to me, is called uh, TREX, which stands for trajectory-based extrapolation. Uh, the key point to to what I want to emphasize here is the following: um, most of the uh, uh, implications of IRL assume that uh, the the data that you use uh, to, in order to infer the reward function is uh, optimal or close to optimal. And, uh, and clearly it's something way easy to do in, in a simulated environment, but something which is very far from obvious in uh, real world applications such as trading. How do you know that uh, the uh, data collected from any particular trader is optimal? What is optimal in the first place, right? So there are a certain, so, so methods such as IR, uh, maximum entropy IRL are uh, um, forgiven uh, to an extent to you because they do not assume that literally each action taken by an agent is optimal, but they rather assume that suboptimality is a kind of sampling issue. So, so you have a, a optimal um, policy, which is the distribution, which is stochastic policy. And whenever you see suboptimal action is just a, a sample according to its probability, right? But uh, this T-Rex thing uh, uh, actually learns the intent of the agent and it does not assume optimality of demonstrations. Uh, so, so in a sense, it performs extrapolation of a, a action of the agents. Um, so we have examples uh, in, uh, you can run notebooks and you can see how uh, these three methods actually perform and, and why uh, T-Rex uh, uh, seems more promising. Uh, because it produces uh, uh, better looking results. So in the interest of time, I'll skip uh, some uh, interesting uh, applications of IRL. We have, uh, we have a chapter uh, section in the book and also a regional paper, which we wrote with Matthew uh, uh, on, on two related algorithms uh, for uh, direct and inverse reinforcement learning that we call the G-learner uh, and Go. Uh, uh, which exactly implement this, uh, this concept of, of working with uh, tractable and quadratic uh, reward functions. All right, so this is the uh, uh, picture of a section in the book. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip uh, the performance of this. Uh, here is the reference to the original paper. Now, uh, the last thing I want to mention is, is that um, uh, and this has to do with my previous comment that uh, in IRL setting, you do not always observe actions of the trader, but you rather observe what is easily observed is market dynamics. And then a, an interesting question would be, can we actually apply the concepts of reinforcement learning, inverse reinforcement learning to the market as a whole? Like, can we think of a market as a, some sort of an agent? If it's an agent, what's its utility function? Uh, how it optimally invests in, in different uh, stocks, et cetera. And uh, it turns out that uh, uh, you can apply uh, this, this concept, this approach of inverse reinforcement learning to such sort of an agent, uh, which kind of implements the, the idea of invisible hand of the market. So that's why we call it the invisible hand agent. All right, and again, there are, uh, there are corresponding sections in the book and, uh, and there is also the original paper referenced here. So uh, this is more or less uh, what I had to say. Uh, coming back to the book, again, the structure of those last chapters is that in chapter nine, we have a general intro to RL, including this uh, financial quick walk and then some other uh, simple cases such as optimal trading. And then chapter 10 uh, talks about uh, extensions, uh, applications for for option pricing, which I didn't have to, uh, didn't have chance to talk about today, uh, or portfolio trading, and then a very uh, long chapter uh, eleven talks about different uh, applications of inverse reinforcement learning. Uh, and finally, we have uh, uh, one more chapter twelve, which is uh, which is uh, 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 it's not a teaching material; it's rather uh, research topics. 
Uh, but uh, the reason I mention it here is because uh, these research topics are pretty much related with uh, IRL and in particular with the applications of IRL to the market as a whole. And there are some other uh, you know, interesting topics which have to do with, uh, with uh, uh, for example, uh, interesting uh, concepts of uh, reinforcement, oh, sorry, of machine learning that deal with unification of different approaches. Uh, uh, so, for example, uh, recent work of uh, DeepMind uh, uh, came up with an interesting concept uh, where they built uh, a model of the world, but this model is not built to predict the future. The, the, the only purpose of this model is to facilitate uh, the optimal decision making. And uh, I think and hope that uh, we may find uh, similar approaches for our financial applications. And on this point, I, I stop and pass it over to Paul. Thank you very much.